A Mayan elder wearing traditional Mayan garb walks into a bar. He sits down and strikes up a conversation with the bartender. And the bartender says, Hey, you don't look like you're from around here. Where are you from? The Mayan elder says, Earth. And the bartender says, So what do your people believe in? And the Mayan elder replies, Well, our people believe that the Earth rests on a giant crocodile sitting in a lake of water lilies. And the bartender says, Wow, that's fascinating. Tell me more. An Anishinaabe elder, wearing a traditional feathered headdress, walks into a bar. The bartender says, Hey, partner, where are you from? And the Anishinaabe elder says, Around these parts. The bartender says, The last guy I had in here believed the earth was on a crocodile. What do your people believe in? And the Anishinaabe elder replies, Well, our people believe that the earth sits on the back of a giant turtle resting in a great ocean. The bartender says, Wow, that's incredible. Tell me more. A gentleman sitting at the bar then walks up to the bartender and says, Hey, I heard you talking with those native wisdom keepers about the earth. Do you know what I believe? The bartender says, No. What? The bar patron says, I believe that the earth is flat. The bartender says, The earth is a ball, you idiot. Get the fuck out of my bar. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift up on Apollo 11. Tower Welcome, everyone. For those of you who are not familiar with the work I do, feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Marty Leads 33, or my main site, MartyLeads33.com. On my YouTube page, I have a folder entitled Begin Here if you want to further your exploration into the worlds of gematria, symbolism, numerology, mysticism, theology, and more. No real worries if you are not aware of what it is I do, as I won't be doing too much numeric work in this video. But if you are wondering what all that weird math is that occasionally pops up, well, there's your answer. The following video is for educational purposes only. For those of you that might not be aware, and for a select few of you this may actually come as quite a shock, but there is a heated debate going on currently with an exponentially growing group of people who believe, and many who are absolutely convinced, that the Earth is flat. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people who are exploring the notion that this Mother Earth that we live on does not revolve around the Sun and is in fact a motionless, flat plane, and the stars, Sun, and Moon, literally the entirety of the cosmos, revolve around the Earth, a model called geocentrism. A majority of these folk are very dedicated to their cause and are making their case with passion and gusto. There are hordes of independent researchers online who are posting videos with much evidence to support their claims, and average everyday people have taken up doing scientific experiments for themselves to test the veracity of the claims made by scientists and space agencies across the known world that the Earth is part of a heliocentric or sun-centered system. Blogs have been written, podcasts recorded, comment sections flooded. Hell, there's even been several books written about it. These people are dedicated and very serious about supporting a new flat earth model to replace our currently accepted heliocentric system. But as you will come to see, this presentation really isn't going to be about questioning the rotundity of the earth. It's actually a video ultimately about civility and discourse and the human heart but we'll get into all of that in just a bit. For many, the initial response to hearing the idea that people are actually considering the notion that we live in an Earth-centered or geocentric universe usually takes the form of something like the following. Who in the bloody hell thinks the world is flat? What kind of moron believes such nonsense? Have you ever been up in an airplane and seen the curvature of the Earth? Stupid. Shit is round like the other planets. Ever hear of the Hubble telescope? Dummy. The majority of us, at least those who receive their education from a federally mandated academic curriculum, have been told since kindergarten about the rotundity and sphericity of the Earth. In fact, globes often find their way into classrooms across the world. The Earth being a spinning globe and going around the sun was and is taught as absolute fact. 
But if you were like me, you probably often question whether or not you really learned anything in school. There are many people who ridicule the idea of even having a discussion or debate on this subject. For many, there is a sheer absurdity of even questioning the rotundity of the earth in the first place. A vast majority of the public, many of whom more than likely consider themselves educated, feel that such considerations are for the brain dead and primitive. To even consider the notion that the earth is flat, for many, is a complete waste of time. And that is exactly why we are going to investigate this subject today. Is there any great flaw or fault in restating our assumptions and clarifying with scientific precision the things that we have come to know to be quote-unquote true and without question? What is so wrong with critically examining fundamental and widely accepted ideas about such things as the shape of the earth and the nature of the system that we reside in? How often have we ever even considered questioning the celestial mechanics of the world in which we live? Are we supposed to take at face value the promulgations made by governments and self-proclaimed authorities of science informing us about the heavens above? If you were like me, you take to heart what the great George Carlin said about governments. How much does the average person even know about the movements of the planets, the sun, the moon, and the earth? Quite some time ago, as I first started exploring the Flat Earth model, I posted something on my Facebook account asking my friends a simple question, and it was essentially this. Does the moon rotate on its axis? Now, this seems like it should be a pretty easy question to answer, one that an educated populist would be able to answer without so much as a glance at a textbook or looking the answer up online, but funny enough, the answers in the comments section varied so wildly and so completely that it made me realize that most people are going through life clinging, sometimes desperately, to models, ideas, and paradigms that they really know nothing about. And this is a serious problem. So what do we do about this problem? Well, the best way I have always learned to get to the bottom of things is to apply the scientific method, using reason and logic as my guides to make tangible the best answers to the proposed questions at hand. The whole flat earth movement and phenomenon affords us, meaning the whole of mankind, the perfect opportunity to place each and every one of us at the center of a grand scientific experiment. This social movement allows mankind the opportunity to put himself through a litmus test. A litmus test is defined as a decisively indicative test, and is traditionally used to determine the acidity or alkalinity of chemical substances. Or in other words, it decisively indicates the nature of the subject tested. Hey, is it alkaline or is it acidic? Is it A or is it B? Is it black or is it white? And as we may come to find, sometimes these things aren't so cut and dry as we thought. Not only does the debate of the rotundity or flatness of the earth provide humanity a perfect opportunity to reapply our own scientific knowledge and engage in the learning process once again, things we can only construe as intellectually progressive exercises, it also presents ourselves with a litmus test, challenging our own application and understanding of the scientific method. Our litmus test will be A. Are we using the scientific method, not relying on preconception or bias to arrive at our conclusions? Or B. Have we failed at such a noble objective? And let us make no mistake about it. The pursuit of science is not relegated to the universities and institutions of higher learning. Science, by definition, is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Anyone can make those observations and experiments. Science is a method of investigation, not a set of beliefs. Science is not monopolized by governmental institutions and by men in white lab coats. Science belongs in the hands of each and every human being on this earth, regardless of what anyone says. First of all, if you're a fucking guy that's making YouTube videos about the earth being flat, that shit isn't research. It's just not. It's not re you're not a scientist. You're not wearing a lab coat. You don't work for a major university. Just because you're some fucking jack off alone in your room obsessing about nonsense, that's not research. Damn, I'd hate to be one of those fucking guys on YouTube making a video on the flat earth who obviously has nothing important to say.
The fact is, science and its basic methods are easy to follow and abide by. The pillars of the scientific method consist of asking questions, doing background research, constructing a hypothesis based on the testing and analyzation of that data, drawing a conclusion and reporting the results. Scientific research must be repeatable, verifiable, demonstrable, as well as able to undergo a healthy amount of scrutiny and criticism. Simple as pie. What often gets in the way of the pure pursuit of science is the human ego. Cordiality and congeniality are lost when the unadulterated quest for truth gets tainted by all sorts of corrupting forces, such as money, power, greed, and pride, all things quite prevalent in the current collective human condition. We must always keep emblazoned in our minds the understanding that ridicule, belittlement, derision, disparaging and derogatory remarks, ad hominem attacks, and the like have no place within scientific inquiry, nor in social civility. In the noble pursuit of science, if one attacks another for simply making an inquiry or asking a question, you can be sure that that individual is not, in any way, shape, or form, engaging in the scientific method. Period. We must abandon any inclinations to revert to childishness and always be constructive with our debates and discussions. Whether we recognize it or not, humankind has a moral stake in being kind. The word itself reminds us of this absolute truth. One, two, three, four. What I wish to do here is simply present 10 interesting points of contention that I have personally found compelling throughout my own investigation of the Flat Earth Movement. This video is not intended to be an unbiased scientific investigation because ultimately that investigation rests in your hands and in the hands of the community at large. Since we will only be covering 10 unique questions surrounding the nature and construction of our earthly system, this investigation is obviously anything but conclusive. But I do feel that addressing and highlighting these 10 particular aspects will make a strong enough case as to why so many people have begun to seriously question our proposed heliocentric system. It must be noted that there are so many different facets to consider when it comes to understanding the very dynamic system that creates our blessed little home here in the universe. Obviously, when confronted with such a dynamic system as our solar-slash-geocentric system, there is a bevy of varying phenomenon that one has to take into consideration. Things like the phases of the moon, the path of the sun, the cause of seasons, the retrograde motion of planets, the mechanics of the pole star, flight paths, the cause of tides, eclipses, etc., 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 Without a doubt, there are countless things that must be taken into consideration before we may draw any sort of final conclusion on the matter. The goal here is not to cover each and every one, for time dictates otherwise. There is now a growing and bountiful outpouring of videos on YouTube, with varying degrees of quality and truthfulness, that anyone may go and explore if they so choose. If you have questions about the proposed Flat Earth model not covered here, which you surely should and will, there are numerous sites that cover each and every one. When undergoing your investigation, I would only add this. When combing through the endless videos and material on this subject, you will come across many characters. There are deceivers, liars, people with wild and outlandish imaginations, people who have done little to no homework, people who place blame where blame is not to be placed, people with squirrely revelations and mad prophecy, people who claim to have answers, and people who work full-time at propagating disinformation. There are also a lot of very loving and kind people out there, Many trying to make sense of an often senseless world, and so many who simply seek truth. In short, and in other words, be careful. It's a jungle out there. The ten different topics I personally found compelling and the ones we will be examining in this video are the following. Number one, the model, heliocentric and geocentric. Though there are many other systems other than these two that have been purported throughout time, such as simulation theory, concave earth, etc., we are going to be looking at these two particular ones exclusively because of the fact that we have been taught the heliocentric model and the flat earth movement has caught the most steam recently. 
we are going to give a brief overview of both models as best as my meager mind understands them. Number two, horizon, perspective, and viewable distances. We are going to take a look at, well, how human beings look at the world, what we can see, how far we can see, and how the world appears to us. Number three, sun hotspot in the earth. We're going to take a quick look at a video from a high altitude weather balloon and look at how the sun appears to us in this film. Number four, angles of light and the sun's rays. We're going to take a look at the rays of the sun and the claim that the sun is 93 million miles away. Number five, NASA and the space agencies of the world. We are going to examine two short videos supposedly taken of the Earth from space, provided by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency and the National Aeronautics Space Administration. Number six, the sun and the moon. We are going to take a short scroll through the myriad questions surrounding the relationship between these two heavenly bodies and our mother Earth. Number seven, proof of the Earth's spin. We're going to ask the question, can we determine from our position on Earth that the Earth spins at roughly a thousand miles an hour? Number eight, the existence of gravity. We're going to watch a university professor explain how the gravitational constant was discovered and take a look into what is known as the Cavendish experiment. Number nine, an analysis of a time-lapse video of the sun. We are going to watch a brief video showing a time-lapse of the sun and analyze what we are seeing. Number 10, the astrolabe. The astrolabe is an ancient astronomical computer and we are going to take a look at its functionality today. Okay, so here we go. Number one, the model, heliocentric or geocentric. What I'm going to try to do here is present very succinctly the general outline and model for both the heliocentric and geocentric systems, again, as best as I understand them. We will take a quick look at basic explanations for the phenomenon we see, as well as look at a quick history of both, and I will try to do this as commonsensical and tersely as I possibly can. So the first model we intend to investigate is the heliocentric system, the system that we have all come to know and the one that we learned about in our state-run educational curriculum. In the heliocentric system, the sun, or helios, resides at the center of the system, with that sun flying through space at nearly half a million miles an hour, or 483 miles per hour to be more precise. The Earth, one of the planets in an entire system of planets, revolves around the sun at roughly 67,000 miles per hour, in a large orbit taking 365.24 days to complete. This elliptical orbit around the sun finds the Earth 93 million miles away from the sun in summer, and 3 million miles closer to the sun, or 90 million miles away during winter, a fairly counterintuitive phenomenon called aphelion and perihelion. The band of stars that we see overhead at night is called the Milky Way galaxy, and is the spiral galaxy that our solar system is a very minute part of. The stars we see in the night sky are millions of light years away, a light year being the measure of time it would take light to reach a destination. Our galaxy is just one of literally trillions of galaxies that exist in the ever-expanding universe, giving rise to the notion and statistical probability that Earth, and the life that exists upon it, though unique in its own way, is probably nothing special as there are many solar systems and many Earth-like planets out in the heavens. The Earth itself is an oblate spheroid, tilted at 23.4 degrees, and rotates counterclockwise on its axis to the tune of roughly a thousand miles an hour at the equator. This rotation is said to cause day and night. The moon rotates around the Earth, with the moon itself rotating on its own axis. And even though the moon spins on its axis, we never see this rotation, and hence we never see the dark side of the moon, and this is due to the fact that the spin of the moon is tidally locked to the Earth's rotation. The heliocentric system is a rather newly adopted system, having first been introduced in the mid-1500s by Nicholas Copernicus in his book On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, released upon his death in 1543. The ancient Greek Aristarchus had proposed a heliocentric theory in roughly 250 BC, possibly working off the theories of the mythical Pythagoras, who supposedly lived a few hundred years prior, but his theories fell out of favor with many adopting the geocentric model as proposed by the likes of Aristotle and Ptolemy. The geocentric or flat earth system puts the earth at the center of the drama, with the sun, moon, and stars above revolving around it, just as mankind perceives it. The sun and moon at varying speeds with one another make roughly concentric paths around the center of the earth, with many postulating a magnetic pole or source dictating these paths. The rising and setting of the sun is caused by perspective, 
with the sun rising as it approaches the viewer's vanishing point along the horizon and sets as it moves away from the viewer and ultimately out of sight. The sun stereographically projects onto the plane of the earth and acts as a spotlight, which is the cause of day and night. The sun and moon are roughly the same size and same distance away, just as they appear, with current figures given for those objects to be roughly 32 miles in diameter and approximately 3 to 4,000 miles away. The moon, like the sun, is its own light source, and the phases of the moon are more than likely caused by the moon itself, and not by reflected light from the sun, as understood in the heliocentric model. The Earth is stationary, and the stars in the heavens revolve around the Earth, hence why the pole star, or Polaris, always remains visible, no matter what season it is on the Earth. The Earth has a central pole, being the North Pole, with the southern magnetism being attributed to an ice wall or shelf surrounding and holding in the oceans, what is deemed Antarctica on the globular model. Many Flat Earth proponents point out the fact that Antarctica is essentially off-limits to independent investigations due to the Antarctic Treaty of 1961, signed jointly by many of the most powerful nations in the world. The Flat Earth model has no need for gravity or stars billions of light years away because the stars are close and contained within the Earth-Sky system. Relativity also becomes irrelevant because there is indeed an up and indeed a down, just as we experience here on Earth. There are several members of the geocentric community that make it a point to note and clarify that they do not necessarily believe that the Earth is not a sphere, but rather that the flat landmass that mankind stands on is not wrapped on the outside of the sphere, but instead a flat plane existing within a sphere, much like you would see in a snow globe. Many flat earthers postulate a literal firmament or dome that contains the heavens above, which parallels and is in accord with many different mythologies and religious scriptures. The Flat Earth model has been in existence for thousands of years, has been adopted the world over by Mayan, Hindu, Jain, Buddhist, Egyptian, Norse, Native American, Chinese, and numerous other cultures. Both the Holy Bible and the Quran seem to strongly suggest a Flat Earth cosmogony. The previous is, as already stated, a very brief and abridged explanation of both models, as best as I can understand them, and further exploration and research is encouraged by those who may be unfamiliar with the inner workings of each one. Ultimately, when undergoing our own hands-on scientific investigation into this subject, when presented with particular questions about the mechanics of these models, if we are to uphold the grand pillars of the scientific method, we should simply provide the most concise explanation to the queries. As we move on, and as you move on with your own investigation, the question that you should always hold in the back of your mind is simply, as a heliocentrist, how do I explain this? As a geocentrist, how do I explain this? And hell, if you're a Mayan elder, you should probably explain how all of this looks from the back of a crocodile. Okay, let's move on. Number two, horizon perspective and viewable distances. The horizon from our perspective, 360 degrees all the way around, always appears flat. No matter how high you climb in elevation, the horizon will always rise up and be level with your eyes. High altitude balloons have traveled upwards of 33 miles in elevation, and when the curvature of the camera lens, usually a GoPro fisheye lens, is accounted for, which changes the horizon line from convex to concave to flat as it bounces, we find that the horizon remains completely flat and no curvature is ever seen. How can this phenomenon be best explained? The Flat Earth model explains this by the fact that the Earth is a plane, not a planet, and therefore what is viewed with the eye is consistent with the actual flat, extended plane in which we live. The best explanation from those in the heliocentric camp explain this occurrence by the fact that no one has just gotten high enough in elevation to see the curvature, due to the immensity of the Earth. The horizon only looks flat because we are seeing a very small portion of the mass of Earth. Pics from NASA and other space agencies also show the curvature of the Earth as well. Personally, I must say that, though the heliocentric explanation at first hand may seem plausible, it is not consistent with the math as given to us by spherical geometry. People all over the world, myself included, have reported seeing distances that, according to the basic mathematics of a sphere that has an equator of roughly 25,000 miles or so, should just not be visible. Objects 20, 30, 60 miles away and further have been spotted, many of which at sea level, that just should not be seen according to the math. Ships that have supposedly sailed over the curvature of the Earth when zoomed in with a telephoto lens can clearly be seen, 
which is completely inconsistent with the heliocentric or globular Earth perspective. Number 3. Sun Hotspot on the Earth In this very popular video that has made its way around the Flat Earth community, a high-altitude balloon was sent up by the company Dog Cam Sport to shoot footage of the Earth in an effort to promote their online camera company. As far as I am aware, this video is real and is not fabricated whatsoever. We can clearly see in one part of the footage that the sun makes a hot spot on the Earth. The question this video poses is, if the sun is 93 million miles away from the Earth as claimed by modern astronomers, then how in the world is the sun creating a singular, circular, very clear hot spot on the Earth? The Flat Earth proponents explain this simply by saying the sun is not 93 million miles away. It is actually rather close, and so this phenomenon we see makes perfect sense. If the sun is 93 million miles away, then the rays that would reach the Earth would engulf the Earth equally and be parallel to one another, as shown in this graphic. Though I have looked fairly extensively for an answer to this anomaly by the Globe Earth proponents, I have yet to find one that is personally satisfactory. Number 4. Angles of Light in the Sun's Rays In this picture we see the rays of the sun bursting through the clouds, and it is very easy to see that the rays converge to a point that seems to exist just beyond the clouds. Many people experience this phenomenon every single day, and I must say that personally it is quite a beautiful and magical sight. We must conclude that if the sun is 93 million miles away, the rays that would reach the earth would reach the earth at a 90 degree angle, with all rays parallel to one another, as just mentioned. The flat earth community explains this occurrence by the fact that the sun is close to the earth, once again roughly 3,000 or so miles away, and the viewable light is converging directly back to the sun itself. The only answer I have found that describes this phenomenon by the Glober theorists is that the sun's rays are reflecting off the various layers of the Earth's atmosphere, with those layers being the exosphere, thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, and troposphere. The light rays, once they reach the Earth, are dispersed, which is caused by light refraction, or the bending of a wave when it enters a medium, where its speed is different. I take issue with this explanation personally because if such were true, should we not see divergent rays all over the sky instead of this phenomenon simply happening locally? Number 5. NASA and the Space Agencies of the World For this one we are going to ask one simple question. Can NASA and the numerous other space agencies of the world be trusted when it comes to the information that they provide? Most news programs, media outlets, and your average everyday nightly news-watching citizen will accept without question or controversy the claims made by any and all of these space organizations. Images and data sent from the New Horizons satellite floating towards Pluto billions of miles away, the Curiosity rover on Mars picking up samples of the Martian surface, the Hubble telescope snapping pictures and videos of quasars, pulsars, nebula, etc. all throughout the universe. Assertions of water on the moon and other Earth-like planets existing all over the cosmos, all of these claims are usually taken at face value without any serious investigative team ever questioning their scientific legitimacy, or demanding verifiable proof for the information offered as absolute fact. Average everyday people don't often ask questions like, hey, how does the International Space Station handle traveling speeds of 17,500 miles an hour around the Earth in the thermosphere that is said to reach temperatures of 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit? How does the International Space Station ground itself without ever touching ground as it continually builds up a static electric charge cruising around the Earth? How does the Cassini satellite cruise through the rings of Saturn unscathed while we are told that the rings of Saturn are made of billions of pieces of ice, dust, and rocks, some as small as a grain of salt, while others as big as houses. It is questions like these, along with so many others, that have many people in the Flat Earth movement doubting the whole nine yards. I will be playing two quick videos. The first one is provided by the folks at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and is a supposed shot of the dark side of the moon as it passes before Earth, in a roughly 25-hour period. The second one was released by the Japanese Space Agency, and is supposed to be a video taken of Earth rotating in space. Let us take a look at the first video. This video is said to have been taken by a satellite floating somewhere around a million miles from Earth. As you can see, even though the video is supposed to be of a 25 hour period, the shot is perfectly still and the cloud formations hardly, if ever, move in this entire span of time. Besides looking just absolutely fabricated, it must also be noted that the moon crosses a great distance over the Earth in this video, which is completely inconsistent with what we are told the orbit of the moon should take around the Earth, which is a period of approximately 28 days. Also pay attention to the fact that not a single star is seen in the background. Where are they? 
There are numerous anomalies and inconsistencies with this video, and even the untrained eye can see that this footage has some serious issues with its authenticity. The second video is provided by the Japanese Space Agency, and shown here is supposedly a video of the Earth as it spins, creating day and night. If you take notice, the camera is once again perfectly still, not a nudge, shake, bump, or shift in the viewpoint, which in itself seems completely illogical considering that this was supposed to have been taken from a weather satellite drifting in orbit in the vacuum and infinitude of space. As you can clearly see, the clouds all move together in perfect harmony, almost as if one enormous weather pattern swept over the entirety of the Earth. Notice that when the day turns to night, no lights can be seen on the Earth. Is this because the satellite is too far away to detect them? Also notice we do not see any of the supposed 1800 satellites orbiting the Earth, nor do we see the International Space Station that is supposed to be traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. Also take note, just like the last video, the absence of stars in the background. Though we can see stars here on Earth very clearly, and astronauts at NASA recently admitted seeing stars in space, it is a complete wonder why we do not see a single one in any of these videos. I have personally shown these videos to non-conspiracy minded people and asked them point blank if they believed that the footage that they were viewing was real or CGI and the response I received every time was a laughing, absolutely not, that is fake as hell and obviously computer generated. The internet is littered with sites, once again of varying quality and accuracy, that have heap loads of evidence that calls into question literally everything these space agencies do. From the International Space Station to the Apollo moon landing hoax, there is an excited, passionate, and fast-growing demographic of people that are calling bullshit to the claims the governments of the world are making, and they are backing up their grievances with mountains of evidence. I have done an entire video on my own personal feelings towards NASA that you can find on my channel entitled Curiosity Roving Through the Claims of NASA which is a concise and to-the-point video addressing many concerns and anomalies with the information released by this American Space Agency. I feel that it is well worth your time. The fact is, when examining whether or not the Earth upon which we stand is part of a geo- or heliocentric system, we must take into deep consideration the possibility that the very people who tell us about the heavens above are lying to us about what they know. Only someone engaging in the true scientific method would understand that this factor, in order to make the most complete and thorough study possible, must be accounted for. Number 6. The Sun and the Moon The image here is presented to give you a rough perspective of the proposed sizes and distances of the Earth and our Sun in the heliocentric model, as given to us by official sources. The Sun is on the right there with its approximate size and the Earth is on the left with its approximate size, given here in English miles. That line in between the Earth and Sun is to denote a measure of 1 million miles, which means there would be 92 million more of those lines between the Sun and us here on Earth. This is a distance of such enormity that I cannot even draw to scale on this screen and make the Earth visible to the naked eye. For this topic, we're going to take a much more philosophical and honestly theological approach. The sun and the moon as united polarities have been celebrated throughout history. I think it's safe to say that there is not a culture, nor tribe, nor civilization across the known world that does not pay homage or draw particular attention to these two heavenly bodies. Now, I am not necessarily trying to advocate the belief in a god here on this point, but standing back and looking at the relationship of these heavenly bodies with our earth and analyzing it with a purely mechanistic and engineering mindset, either one of these models, whether geocentric or heliocentric, at least in my humble opinion, clearly expresses elements of design, intelligence, and intention. In the heliocentric model, we have a sun and moon appearing the exact same size in our sky from our perspective on earth, with a whopping nearly 93 million miles difference between them. The idea that this Goldilocks zone that the Earth is in, or this perfected balance maintained long enough for such biological complexity to arise, is somehow just happenstance and accident and the result of simple laws of physics, seems, to be downright blunt, absolutely absurd. What is there more evidence of here? Design or chaos? Intelligence or haphazardness? Holistic functionality on a micro and macro scale or a jumbled volatile mess? If you were in Vegas and you had to bet the farm on whether or not such a perfect, exquisite equilibrium between the sun and the moon was created with A. Intelligent design or B. Consciousless randomness, what would you choose? 
The geocentric model also delivers us into notions of a creator as well when we analyze how its proposed system works. A flat plane with a possible dome overhead encasing the landmass, a sort of terrarium if you will, that within it has two spheres or disks rotating around it, creating a cycle in which life may continually flourish and then pass away, not to mention the entirety of the stars above rotating around this whole thing. I mean, how are we supposed to imagine this as accident? Like I said, I'm not trying to convince you of anything here, but to me, it's hard to imagine, whatever model we use to explain our world, that there is not intelligence at work here. How can man, as an intelligent animal, somehow use his intelligence to come to the conclusion that the nature that he was born from is unintelligent? That seems like really, really bad logic. I honestly have so many questions surrounding the sun and the moon that they are too numerous to address here. I will say this though, understanding their beauty is simple. To rest on my poetic laurels here, no matter what model we use, and no matter how the mechanics of these objects ultimately plays out, the sun and the moon to me are declarations of cosmic grace. To track the phases of the moon and the cycle of the sun requires no telescope nor complex mathematics. It just simply requires you to look up into the sky every day and every evening. Number seven, the spin of the earth. The question is, can we tell if the earth from our perspective is spinning or not? Can we somehow detect, calculate, and measure from where you and I stand the supposed spin of the earth? Now the flat earth community claims that the earth is motionless and still, and that no motion of the earth can ever be detected because by fact there is none. Many even go so far to say that without the information from the government space agencies of the world, a person cannot even prove himself that the Earth somehow encircles the sun. This quote from Albert Einstein on the spin of the Earth sums up our question pretty nicely. The struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would then be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system would be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. Besides images from the space agencies of the world, the heliocentric proponents often point to the Foucault pendulum for evidence of spin. Here is a quick video explaining how the Foucault pendulum works. A uh, Foucault pendulum is a pendulum with a specially designed pivot, designed so that it can swing back and forth in any direction around the vertical. So that's in contrast to, for example, a grandfather clock, where the pendulum has to swing in a particular plane. Let's imagine that you have a Foucault pendulum and you're at the north pole of the Earth. When you set the pendulum swinging, you determine a plane in which the pendulum is swinging. And that plane is fixed. So as the Earth rotates, the Earth rotates underneath the plane of the pendulum swinging. And so if you now go back and imagine that you're standing on the Earth, you see the plane of the pendulum rotate every 24 hours. Now as you go to lower latitudes away from the North Pole, the time that it takes the pendulum, the plane of the pendulum to rotate around lengthens. And in fact, at the equator, the plane doesn't rotate at all. At the latitude of Hanover, it takes 35 hours for the plane to rotate. So if you look at this pendulum here, if we look at it a few minutes from now, we won't even be able to detect that the plane of the pendulum swing has changed. But if you come back in an hour, uh, you will definitely see that it's moved a little bit. And if you come back in nine hours, this plane of this pendulum here will have rotated by 90 degrees, a very distinct change that you can easily see. The design of the Foucault pendulum is fairly simple. The pendulum is a heavy mass on the end of a very long chain, suspended so it can swing freely in any direction. And through this simple system, it is said that we are able to measure the rotation of the Earth. According to the heliocentric model, the atmosphere is said to spin with the Earth, and hence the air above and the ground below are a closed system, and thusly spin and are linked together as the Earth rotates. This science is well substantiated within the physics community, and this quote-unquote fact is not questioned. 
The entire mechanism and science behind the Foucault pendulum is based on the fact that the Earth spins below the pendulum and the pendulum continues independently to spin on its own plane. The functionality of this machine flies directly in the face and is a complete contradiction to what is offered up in modern physics. Unless my understanding is severely flawed for the Foucault pendulum science to be correct and thus be a valid instrument to measure the Earth's spin, that would mean that a helicopter could float above the Earth for three hours and arrive at a destination several thousand miles away, which we all know is impossible. Foucault pendulums are working in science museums across the world. I'm going to leave you here with two quotes. Uh, the first one is by Nikola Tesla, and the second one by, once again, Albert Einstein. Earth is a realm. It is not a planet. It is not an object. Therefore, it has no edge. Earth would be more easily defined as a system environment. Earth is also a machine. It is a Tesla coil. The sun and the moon are powered wirelessly with the electromagnetic field, or the ether. This field also suspends the celestial spheres with electromagnetic levitation. Electromagnetic levitation disproves gravity because the only force you need to counter is the electromagnetic force, not gravity. The stars are attached to the firmament. Question, have you ever felt the Earth spin? Number 8, the gravitational constant. Gravity, the force that draws everything towards one another. The formulation of the theory of gravity was brought forward by scientist, alchemist, Kabbalist, and philosopher Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, as Wikipedia states, is widely recognized as one of the most influential scientists of all time and is a key figure in the scientific revolution. His book Principia Mathematica, or The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, first published in 1687, laid the foundation for classical mechanics. The gravitational constant itself was not calculated or determined until the late 19th century, done so by a scientist named Henry Cavendish. I'm going to let this university professor give you a quick background into the history of Mr. Henry Cavendish and his experiment to find the gravitational constant, or Big G. One of my favorite scientists is Henry Cavendish, even though he was uh, part of the rich Dukes of Devonshire that family and incredibly rich, he went to Cambridge to study natural sciences or natural philosophy as it was called, but he had a very curious condition in that he could hardly talk to anybody. So when it came to his Viva exam after three years of study, he fled Cambridge rather than sit in front of the examiners because he was petrified of them. This is not the normal sort of person. He couldn't talk to most people. He couldn't talk to women at all. His housekeeper would get a recipe for something or other and he'd say, no, lamb tonight, leg of lamb, and leave a note for her. He wouldn't say it, he'd write it. He would dine in the evening uh, with his friends and he would talk to them, but if he didn't know somebody, uh, and you wanted to ask him a question, apparently you had to go to the Royal Society and he would be in the room and you'd address the room this question about physics and you postulate and if he felt in the mood he would reply to the room. He was a very strange man. He did most of the experiments quietly on his own, keeping his notebooks and it was only after his death and a persuasive campaign by Clark Maxwell, the famous Maxwell of Maxwell's equations from Cambridge University, that he actually got the notebooks from the estate of the Dukes of Devonshire and discovered after the event that Cavendish had discovered the unit of capacitance, discovered dielectric constants, he discovered uh, Dalton's law of partial pressures, he discovered or written about Coulomb's law, all before these guys had done it and just left it unpublished in his notebooks. Towards the end of his life, he did a crucial experiment, which is represented by these lead balls. He lived in Clapham Common, which is nowadays a very poor part of London, but there it was quite fashionable. And he built his own place. His library he built somewhere else because he didn't want anybody borrowing his books from his house. Otherwise, he would have to ask the book back and he didn't want to talk to them. So his library was four miles away. 
at the back of it, he had a big garden shed, which might seem like the size of my house. And in it, he had two lead balls, like this, suspended from the ceiling. Only this is not to scale. This is, I mean, lead balls. Now, the real problem is that he wanted to measure the attraction between two objects due to gravity. In other words, there's a gravitational attraction between you and me, or between me and this lead ball. So he had to be a long way away to look at the experiment, otherwise he'd interfere with it. So he had a, an aperture, a place where he looked through, and he put a telescope out there, and he stood outside in all weathers, and he was in his 60s doing this, staring through the window to take his measurements over a year. There's another set of lead balls inside there, uh, this experiment really is very difficult to get to work and a, a technician has sawed it apart so, because he got so frustrated. And then right in the middle there's a bit of glass and there's a mirror which is, should be suspended from a torsion wire. So you would set it up like this in his shed and you put it like that and this lead ball would attract that lead ball and this lead ball would attract this one and so it would be pushed a little bit this way and twist the wire and that would be pushed a little bit that way and the wire would twist and as the wire twists the mirror which is dangling in there would twist a little bit and light which comes in would be reflected off at a slightly different angle and all he had to do was measure the angle. He then had to move it the other way around and he didn't move this bit he moved the lead balls round so that you had an equal and opposite effect on the other side so instead of having, you have that configuration, he had a, a, this is a very complicated technical thing for the time. 18th century we're talking about, and he put that, that way round, and then it was pushed the other way. And you could then see the dis displacement. Moreover, you could measure the period of oscillation of this, and from that get the, all the properties of the wire, the torsional constant. And that enabled him to measure big G, the gravitational constant, to an accuracy of 1%. And nobody improved on that for 100 years. He didn't describe it as that. He described it as though he was weighing the Earth. He was calculating the mass of the Earth so that when you're attracted to the Earth through gravity, it's the product of the mass of the Earth, this big gravitational constant divided by R squared, the radius of the Earth squared, which we normally know as acceleration due to gravity. And that quantity is essentially big G, and he measured it. Wikipedia tells us that the Cavendish experiment was the first experiment to measure the force of gravity between masses in the laboratory, and the first to yield accurate values for the gravitational constant. This experiment, and the constant derived from it, has laid the foundation for all the current science and theoretical physics dominating the intellectual landscape of today. The entirety of modern physics, in essence, is anchored, one way or another, on the gravitational constant. Big G is used to measure the weight of galaxies and planetary bodies. It is even used theoretically to calculate the very instance of the birth of the universe. In fact, CERN, or the Large Hadron Collider, is a multi-billion dollar particle accelerator built underground on the border of Switzerland and France that is said to simulate the conditions at the moment of the Big Bang which is the currently accepted cosmological creation story dominating the minds of modern physicists. It is quite remarkable that all of modern physics is based on an experiment that is not continually being tested and retested to authenticate its veracity. Should there not be a continual Cavendish experiment being conducted to make absolutely sure that this experiment is concrete enough to establish such a fundamental in physics? If investors and governments are willing to spend billions and billions of dollars on CERN, why doesn't modern physics demand such money and focus go to verify one of its fundamental laws? I'm going to leave you with this very illuminating quote about the Cavendish experiment, and this comes from a gentleman named Miles Mathis at milesmathis.com. The Cavendish experiment is routinely included in a short list of the greatest or most elegant experiments ever done. Like all of the other existing dogma, it has surrounded itself with a nearly impenetrable slag heap of boasting and idolatry, most, if not all of, sloppy and unanalyzed. This was true even before the internet arose, but now it is true to the nth degree. Like everything else, the Cavendish experiment has added to its armor a thousand Wikipedia-like entries and glosses by a thousand mid-level physics professors. Of the many thousand recent reruns of the experiment, not one appears to have begun with any level of skepticism. Not one is actually set up to test or extend the experiment. 
not one starts with the assumption that Cavendish might have been wrong. Despite the stated sacred nature of the scientific method, actually having an open mind about any standard model theory now appears to be equivalent to heresy or sacrilege. Number 9. An Analysis of a Time-Lapse Video of the Sun The video you are watching right now comes from a YouTuber named P-Brain. The crux of this gentleman's video is aimed at explaining how the path of the sun through our skies, including sunrise and sunset, can be easily determined by simply understanding the laws of perspective, as well as the orbit that the sun takes around the center of the earth, as understood in the geocentric model. As you can see in this clip, the sun gets smaller and smaller on the horizon, and the light fades away and travels with it as it veers off to one side of the horizon. Flat Earth proponents claim that this is exactly what the sun does in a Flat Earth model, and further, if we are to assume that the sun is 93 million miles away, the idea of attributing this phenomenon to the turning of a sphere at such vast distances does not really seem to make logical sense, since from whatever longitude and latitude we are in, the sun should fade evenly across the horizon. This video from the International Space Station shows this phenomenon from space. As you can clearly see, the sun fades evenly across the horizon. I only want to touch on this point here and direct you to this perspective for further investigation, because if you have not approached this model before, it is extremely beneficial to understand it from this viewpoint. Though this is not necessarily an endorsement to this particular man's work, I would highly recommend watching a few of the videos he has put together. Number 10. The Astrolabe the Astrolabe is an ancient astronomical computer that has many uses, including, as told to us by Wikipedia, locating and predicting the positions of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, determining local time, giving local latitude, and vice versa, surveying, and triangulation. The Astrolabe was used during classical antiquity, the Islamic Golden Age, the European Middle Ages, and the Renaissance for all of these purposes. The early astrolabe was supposedly invented by Apollonius of Pergab around 220 BCE, which means that the astrolabe has been prevalent throughout history for over 2,000 years. Astrolabes can be purchased or built today and can be used with precision on our modern night skies. We are going to watch a brief clip from a video given at a TED conference about the astrolabe, its history, uses, and functionality. You can find the complete video on the official TED Talk site, and I would highly recommend watching the video in its entirety. So an astrolabe is relatively unknown uh, in today's world, but at the time, in the 13th century, it was the gadget of the day. It was the world's first popular computer, and it was a device that, is, in fact, is a model of the sky. So the different parts of the astrolabe in this particular type, the reet corresponds to the position of the stars, the plate corresponds to a, a coordinate system, and the mater has some scales and puts it all together. If you were an educated child, you would know how to not only use the astrolabe, you would also know how to make an astrolabe. And we know this because the first treatise on the astrolabe, the first technical manual in the English language, was written by Geoffrey Chaucer. Yes, that Geoffrey Chaucer in 1391 to his little Lewis, his 11-year-old son. And in this um, book, uh, little Lewis would, uh, would know the big idea. And the central idea that makes this computer work is this thing called stereographic projection. And basically the, the concept is how do you represent the three-dimensional image of the night sky that surrounds us onto a flat, portable, two-dimensional surface. The idea is actually relatively simple. Imagine that the Earth is at the center of the universe, and surrounding it is the sky projected onto a sphere. Each point on the surface of the sphere is mapped through the bottom pole onto a flat surface where it's then recorded. So the North Star corresponds to the um, center of the device. The ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, moon, and planets, correspond to an offset circle. The bright stars correspond to little daggers on the reet, and the altitude corresponds to the plate system. Now, the real genius of the astrolabe is not just the projection. The real genius is that it brings together two coordinate systems so they fit perfectly. There's the position of the sun, moon, and planets on the movable reet, and then there's their location on the sky as seen from a certain latitude on the back plate. 
So that's just one use. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, there's probably 350, 400 uses. In fact, there's a text that has over 1,000 uses of this first computer. On the back, there's scales and measurements for terrestrial navigation. You can survey with it. The city of Baghdad was surveyed with it. It could be used for calculating mathematical equations of all different types, and it would take a full university course to illustrate it. The Astrolabe is a computer, a calculator, a perfect measuring mechanism based on a geocentric, stationary model of the Earth. This piece of artistic and scientific brilliance needs no accolade, nor pomp or circumstance to announce its own craftsmanship, for its modern-day workability itself proves the genius of its design. A very profound question we must ask ourselves is, if the Sun is traveling at roughly half a million miles an hour, and the Earth rotates around it at roughly 66,000 miles an hour, how is it even possible to map and track the same set of stars for thousands of years? If we are to assume that the ancients created this calculator with a complete lack of understanding the true heliocentricity of our solar system, and merely created this calculator of the heavens as understood from their perspective and viewpoint, how is it possible they could have crafted such an instrument that maintains such precision over thousands of years? To somehow think that an instrument of such a high and accurate degree of calculability merely works today out of dumb luck or by accident, is rather obtuse. Whoever created this instrument, whatever culture or person made it, their knowledge and ingenuity has withstood the test of time. It would seem that the heavens and the working of its cycles have been known and measurable for a very, very long time. On my now-retired podcast, the Marty Leeds Mathematical Radio Hour, I got the chance to speak with John Major Jenkins. John is a Mayan scholar who has a deep passion for the Mayan peoples, their culture, their heritage, their history, rituals, and cosmology. John has done unparalleled, extensive, and exhaustive work reconstructing the ancient Mayan cosmology. The ancient Mayans held the belief that the Earth was a flat plane having four corners, a general theme and concept shared by many other cultures throughout time, and they also mythologized that the earth rested on the back of a crocodile that swam in a pool of water lilies. The Mayan calendar gained popularity because the calendar reached a very prominent point, what was deemed as the calendar's quote-unquote end date, with this date translating to December 21st, 2012, or the winter solstice in our current Gregorian calendar. This quote-unquote end date of the calendar was no more of an end date than when the clock on the wall reaches noon and the clock starts its cycle over again. According to an immense number of traditional Mayan scholars, prophecy revealed that the time period that we currently live in would be a time of great change and transformation. Now, many people probably remember the hoopla, hype, and propaganda surrounding the whole 2012 meme and the supposed end-of-the-world scenarios repeated exhaustively on news channels, books, and podcasts, and internet sites across the world. There was even a blockbuster Hollywood movie starring John Cusack about 2012. To be clear, there never was any Mayan doomsday prophecy. No Mayan pole shift. No Mayan apocalypse scenario. None whatsoever. Nope. Just the scattered artifacts of a civilization with a superb mathematical and astronomical understanding of the cycles of time. The Mayans' true teachings about this time period was and is something that John Major Jenkins always clearly expressed and echoed throughout his lectures and writings. John was always well-reasoned and very clear about his attitude towards the intellectually deficient ballyhoo surrounding 2012, the prophecy of the Mayan wisdom keepers exclaimed that the conclusion of what is known as the 13 Bakhtun cycle, the time period around 2012, would be a time of great awakening, with this period including a 72-year variance around the alignment. The elders never claimed that anything would particularly happen on the date of December 21, 2012. They just believed that the particular celestial alignment of the sun rising in the dark rift of the Milky Way galaxy was the marking of a great transition and a great change of ages for mankind. The Mayans calculated changes through a very complex and dynamic system of calendars that related and linked astronomical changes in the heavens to those here on Earth. 
In sacred traditions, the heavens and the earth were linked, and so what was happening above was intimately linked to what was happening below. This astronomical alignment of the December 21st solstice sun rising in the center of the dark rift of the Milky Way has a whole new added weight when the geocentricity of our Earth is taken into serious consideration. The ability to track and calculate perfectly vast cycles of time, thousands upon thousands of years, makes a whole lot more sense when you understand that the Earth below you is stationary. We all must stop for a moment and take note of what is currently happening within the psychic weather of our time. Say what you will, the fact is there is a great awakening happening right now in mankind's collective consciousness. Masses of people in an almost desperate attempt to find answers to the world around them are starting to shun their long-held faith in belief structures, operating systems, and organizations they have been born and raised into. Mankind is once again coming to know himself and the world around him. Within even the last 15 to 20 years, especially with the creation of the internet, millions upon millions of people are now exploring the occult sciences like never before. Even within the last five years of my life, I have seen an enormous upsurge of interest in subjects like lost civilizations, alchemy, sacred geometry, Kabbalah, mythology, archaeoastronomy, astrology, conspiracy, secret societies, symbolism, the list goes on and on and on. We live in an age where the esoteric arts are starting to take center stage in people's explorations, investigations, and examinations of the world they live in. This awakening is something that has been ramping up for quite some time now. And this shift that is happening right now, at least according to the unparalleled mathematical and astronomical minds of the Mayans, was calculated a very long time ago and was written in the stars. Though I have no idea how John Major Jenkins feels about the concept of the Earth being flat, I must say it would be hard to argue that if there is any validity to what the Mayan elders were saying, and we are indeed living in a time of great transition, there can be no doubt that the Flat Earth Movement is certainly going to play an enormous part of this supposed prophesied shift. O or not. Today, through the power of the internet and through the widespread dissemination of information, we now have average everyday Jack and Jills, people not constrained by paradigms and politics, not shackled by the stale and lifeless institution supposedly dedicated to the pure pursuit of science, average everyday people going out into the world, making real discoveries, finding real knowledge, and bringing it back to the people. These people are doing grassroots work, obtaining knowledge through self-pursuit, through their own blood, sweat, and tears, and sharing the lessons they have learned along the way. We live in a unique time. A person, by simply spending one or two weekends solidly perusing the right videos and channels on YouTube, may be exposed to more information in those weekends than many have procured across several lifetimes. Though we must as well be surgically discerning when it comes to the information that we gather and trust, the ability to learn has never been greater. We should be grateful we live in a time that the great book of occult knowledge is being opened wide by so many scholars, researchers, and seekers who pursue their interests for no other reason than the great and undying passion they have for truth. I can decidedly say that I certainly no longer believe that the sun is 93 million miles away, that we revolve around it at roughly 66,000 miles an hour, and that the earth is a sphere 25,000 miles at its equator. The entire model that I have been told was absolute fact I now have enormous reservations with, and honestly cannot even begin to defend it anymore. The amount of paradoxes, anomalies, dubious, problematic, and unproven ideas one has to swallow in order to wholesale endorse such a model is now, very clear to me to be, too extensive and numerous to continue putting any sort of faith or focus on such an explanation of our earthly system. This model is something I have spoke passionately about in the past. In fact, here is me exclaiming that the sun is 93 million miles away. Now, the sun is 93 million miles away. It's 93 million miles away. I honestly have absolutely no reason to believe that anymore. If the geocentric model proves out to be true, there can really be no question that this deception is, invariably, one of the greatest conspiracies of all time. 
If such is true, mankind has been sold a lie since the day we were born, and that lie was a lie dreamed up by extremely intelligent dark occult forces, people who have been at work for over several generations. And what is ultimately being hidden and stolen is man's destiny, purpose, and direct proof of his place at the center of all creation. For those who believe it is just too impossible for a conspiracy of such magnitude to exist, and that an elite bloodline or corrupt group of individuals could not fabricate and engineer such a complex conspiracy over several lifetimes, you must consider the following. The York Minster Cathedral, one of the largest Gothic cathedrals in Northern Europe, was completed in 1472 and took 252 years to complete. If a building project of such magnitude can continue on for hundreds of years, over several generations, why would you suppose the engineering and building of a conspiracy could not do the same? For those asking what is the point of lying about the shape of the earth, I would offer this. Throughout my studies, research, and long process of spiritual growth, I came to an immovable understanding and intrinsic recognition of the scintilla and spark of the Great Spirit within all things. It is something that I have held within the center of my heart. It is something that I see without eyes. It is unwavering in my psyche. Such a revelation has empowered me like never before. I found that spark of the Creator within when I was still under the erroneous impression that the earth was a spinning ball, cast out in an infinite and endless universe. I can only wonder how much easier my pursuit might have been if I had not been lied to and instead was taught that everything in the universe literally revolves around the drama of mankind. If I would have been taught that the earth is the center of everything, I can only imagine it would have been that much easier to find the center of myself. For several years now, I have created content books, videos, podcasts, and the like, in an effort of trying to help people understand that man is no accident, that he is created with a great purpose and has a great force within him. I've tried to teach and express passionately how the work of a grand architect is all around us and can be recognized and understood, and that this all-unifying force, with all of its mighty wisdom, has put mankind central to the entire mystery. Now, to get people's attention to understand some of the subjects I talk about, can often be tricky. Gematria, symbolism, numerology, these are all subjects that from the outset can seem pretty difficult to grasp. But when you tell somebody that they've been told their whole life that they live on a ball and that they don't really live on a ball, well, that is a talking point that can get someone's attention real quick. And how one deals with that situation after getting someone's attention is where the human heart comes into play. The great secret of life is not an elusive one. Everyone knows it well for it is lodged deep within our chests and our inner voice reminds us of it all the time. This dimension we inhabit is a moral dimension. Existence itself delivers us into a gradation of experience that includes intense pain and evil and immense joy and love. And man, maneuvering through this oft-perceived madness, regularly finds himself rejoicing in sin and agonized by love. We are given great highs and great lows, and our ultimate task is to navigate through these oceanic swells, anchoring every decision and every action with the goodness of our hearts. What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of existence? What on earth are we doing here? These questions often plague the seeker, and it would seem that we humans have overcomplicated the matter to the point of losing our bearings on this plane of existence. The answers to our most seemingly profound questions are not so convoluted and perplexing. The word earth is an anagram for heart. What are we doing here, you ask? It is no grand mystery to recognize that man's goal on earth is simply to find and secure the love he has in his heart.
The crux of Egyptian philosophical thought, secured within the book of going forth by day, was centered on the human heart. Upon entering the gateway of death, the ancient Egyptians believed that the human being would undergo a ceremony they deemed the weighing of the heart ceremony. In this ceremony, one's heart would be weighed against the feather of Mat. The Mat were 42 moral codes that the Egyptians were to abide by and were principles that helped guide them throughout life. If one's heart weighed less than the feather of Mat, one would then ascend to the heavens and return to the source of all creation. There is good reason why the Egyptians did not call this ceremony the weighing of the brain ceremony or the weighing of the material possession ceremony. Truth does not come from the acquisition of information or acquiring material wealth. Truth comes from within one's own heart. If one follows his heart, it will not steer him wrong. For all you English Gamatri hounds out there, the weighing of the heart ceremony equals 132, and there are 42 principles of Mat, the very feather that is weighed upon the scales. 132 divided by 42 is 3.142, or pi. This Mother Earth is a moral dimension. Mankind's litmus test is a litmus test of his heart. It is a test of his morality. Every moment we are given the choice to either A, lead with our hearts, or B, not. So for the record, I don't really believe that the earth is flat or concave or convex at all. If you ask me my real opinion on what the shape of the earth is, I wouldn't say it looks like this, or like this. Really, the earth looks like this. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Shit's flat as fuck. Much love to all.